Okay, so good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you to be here <laughs> for the second day. Uh, so yeah, today, so this morning we have, um, uh, I will uh, give some theory about uh, GIA, uh, followed by a, a lab uh, with uh, Victor on um, on uh, DIA software. So um, <clears throat> teaching uh, DIA uh, analysis uh, might be a bit tricky and it might be also sometimes difficult to understand. So do not hesitate to stop if you if you get lost. Do not hesitate to stop me and to ask uh, questions. And if, by the way, it's, uh, it happened that you <laughs> you really don't understand, we can uh, take time at, during the break or uh, at lunchtime to, uh, to discuss together and we can explain again. So the learning objecti objectives of this module is uh, by the end of this lecture, you will uh, uh, be able to understand the principle uh, of um, DIA analysis. You will know the different processing workflows and the, the spectral libraries to use. And you will know the main DIA processing uh, software tools. So before to start, uh, just a few definitions. So uh, I think now DDA and DIA, you know what it stands for. Uh, but I will explain in the, during uh, my lecture uh, why we call that DDA or DIA. So SWAT uh, stands for second sequential window acquisition of all theoretical mass spectra. Uh, actually, it's the same thing than DIA. It's a DIA. Uh, it's this, uh, this term has been popularized by um, uh, SciX company uh, when they developed a DIA on their instrument. So sometimes people uh, talk about SWAT, but it's the same than DIA. And finally, Thomson is the unit of mass um, to charge uh, ratio, so M over Z. So often people talk about M over Z, but uh, uh, it might happen that uh, you heard about this uh, this unit, Thompson. So I use it sometimes. And uh, so this uh, this unit is for um, in the honor of uh, JJ Thompson, uh, who is one of the father of the mass spectrometry, and received the Physics Nobel Prize in 1906. So um, <clears throat> to understand the uh, idea, first uh, I would like to go back to the principle of DDA. So I know that you have seen that yesterday, but I want to make sure that you really understand. Uh, DDA before we go back to, uh, we go further with DIA. So uh, when you make an um, DDA experiment, so you uh, uh, you analyze your peptides on your mass spectrometer and what you get on the co your computer at the end of the analysis is um, a profile like that. So this profile is not a spectrum, it's a chromatogram. So you know that it's a chromatogram because uh, the unit you have here is retention time, function of the, the intensity. And it's represent the total ion current, so the TIC. Uh, the TIC is the sum of all signal uh, arriving to the mass spectrometer during the analysis. And so the analysis can be from 30 minutes or even less, now 10 minutes to uh, five hours for the longest trends. And uh, at each time of uh, the profile, you can select uh, uh, one um, time of the profile and you get the corresponding spectrum because what your mass spectrometer is uh, acquiring is uh, spectra. So first you get MS1 spectra, uh, or one MS1 spectrum. And uh, in the, uh, this uh, spectrum, the um, soft acquisition software can select uh, one uh, peak to uh, perform a fragmentation of this peak. And then you get a second uh, spectrum, which is called MS2 spectra uh, or fragmentation spectra or MSMS. So in this second, so in the first uh, type of um, uh, of spectra, the MS1, all the peaks correspond to several peptides that are co-eluting. So peptides that are arriving all together in the mass spectrometer. But in the MS2, is the all the peaks uh, represent the fragment of a, a unique peptide, the peptide that I've been selected uh, for fragmentation. So then the the mass spectrometer uh, does that several times. So you get several. Uh, MS, um, MS2 uh, spectra uh, for each uh, MS1 um, spectrum. So uh, you have a cycle of MS1, several MS2, MS1, several MS2, and so on. So in the end of the analysis, you get uh, thousands of uh, MS1 spectra and 10,000 of uh, MS2 spectra. The MS1 are used for quantification and the MS2 are used to search against the protein database for identification. So 
uh, are all of these funds which are taken for presentation or or just like your year highlights it just some of the MS one spectra? So yeah, for each MS one spectra, there is a selection of a number of peaks. So uh, usually, if you if you uh, parameter your mass spectrometer for a top ten uh, fragmentation, it will take the ten most intense peak in the MS one spectra, perform an, an MS two for each of them, and then acquire again an MS one, select ten, and so on. So, but the problem of this. Um, of this uh, acquisition mode is that is uh, select uh, peaks, but uh, the scanning speed of the mass spectrometer is never fast enough to select all the peptide arriving in the mass spectrometer at the same time. Uh, you have to think that when you inject a, a complex mixture is uh, um, uh, 10,000 or even 100,000 of peptides that are in the, in the complex mixture. So um, many, many uh, peptides arrive at the same time. So you don't have time to uh, fragment to, yeah, to fragment take each, uh, each of them, so to get in, uh, sequence information for each of them. So another uh, uh, acquisition mode has been proposed, which is called the IM. So uh, in that case, we don't select uh, specific uh, peptides, but we uh, the, um, the software acquisition is going to select a windows, uh, which contain uh, several peaks. And, uh, and we acquire systematic windows all along uh, the mass range to cover the whole uh, mass range of the whole, the whole MS1 uh, of the whole MS1 spectrum. So we call that uh, DIA because in, D, in, in DDA, uh, finally you select your uh, peak depending what you have in your MS1 spectrum. In DIA, you don't uh, use finally what's in your MS1 spectrum. You have a systematic uh, selection of the windows to cover all the mass range. So then uh, in the MS2 um, uh, uh, spectra that you get, you have the co-fragmentation of several peaks, all the peaks that are in the same window, and then you get complex MS2 spectra. So because these uh, uh, spectra are complex, they cannot be processed by um, uh, typical uh, DDA softwares with a typical database search. So you need specific uh, DIA tools to um, to uh, process this uh, this type of information. So is it clear for uh, everyone? So um, just as a summary here, so you see that uh, the difference between DDA and DIA. So here is the mass range and here you have the retention time. So what you see is the mass spectrometer doing one MS1, which so the line which cover the whole mass range then several uh, selection of a small window for the peaks during the whole uh, analysis. In DIA, you have, again, we keep the MS1, we do the MS1, but um, for the MS2, we select uh, uh, larger windows to select all the peaks along the mass range. So again, so one uh, in DDA, one precursor, simple MS2 spectra, in DIA, several precursor in the same MS2, so complex MS2 spectrum. So as I said earlier, in DDA, the identification is done by uh, using the, the, the fragment mass in the MS2 spectra, and the quantification is done by uh, um, integrating the area under the precursor peak, so in the MS1, using the MS1 uh, spectra. In DIA, the identification is done differently. What you do is you are going to reconstruct uh, the peaks for all the fragments. So that in the same way that I explained yesterday, how to reconstruct a peak from, um, from a spectrum. So you can do that with each um, fragment. And what you are uh, searching for is uh, um, co coelution uh, co of different fragments. So when you have this superposition, it means that all the, the fragments belongs to the same peptide. So this superposition is the sign that you have selected all the fragments uh, corresponding to a same peptide. So it's what the software are doing to find the identification information. And the quantification is done by integrating the, the, area, the area under these peaks. So we use MS2. So in both cases, we use the MS2. 
So again, it's the view of this uh, superposition is what you are trying to get. So it's uh, the extraction of the signal of different fragments belonging to the same peptides. So do you have a question? Is it clear? Okay, so uh, to set up uh, the IA experiments, there is three important things to do. So uh, first, optimize your DIA acquisition scheme. Uh, second, choose uh, the type of uh, spectral library you want to use to process the data, and then select the processing tools you, you want to use. So about the acquisition scheme, so you have to remember that LCMS is a dynamic process. So uh, the question is how, how many uh, points, how many measurements I will have across my peak. So to understand that, so I wrote down an example to make you, so I really write down completely that you uh, that it, uh, you will be able to read that again and understand really what I mean. But uh, what I mean is uh, when you have, um, uh, so during the, the, the acquisition, the mass spectrometer constantly acquires MS2 for precursor window that cover the whole mass range. So one after the other, the first, uh, the first window, um, 400, 420, 420, 440, and so on. But during this time, the peptides, they are eluting. So if you want to reconstruct the chromatographic peak of, um, of a peak which is, uh, of a peptide which is eluting um, in the first window, so a peptide that have a mass of 415, for instance, you need to acquire this window uh, often enough to be able to reconstruct the peak because uh, so this peptide is in the first window, but then you are acquiring the second, the third, and so on, and then you come back to the first one, and so on. So you have a cycle, and this cycle time needs to be uh, short enough to have enough measurement of the same uh, peptide. So you can see that here. So when you have two uh, few um, number of major, sorry. How do you define the window range? The, the, the size of the window, I'm, I'm coming to that. <laughs> so um, if, you, uh, if your cycle is too long, you don't have enough measurements across the peak. So you see here that you have only three measurements uh, on your peak, and your peaks become triangles. So if the cycle is even longer, you even completely lose the peak. Uh, lose the peak. And uh, in this um, uh, work by um, uh, Lynn Sepino and colleagues, uh, they have theoretically calculated how many points you should have across a peak to have an, uh, uh, and they calculate actually the error between a theoretical uh, peak and, um, and what will happen depending on the number of points you have on your peak. So if you have uh, nine points across the peak, you have enough point to have um, an error um, that is acceptable. Uh, between six and nine, uh, the error becomes to be uh, more uh, important. And if you have less than six, you have really uh, too much error and the measurement of the quantification uh, will be um, terrible. So to know the number of, um, of points, uh, the, to know the, the cycle time you need to have enough points uh, on your peak, uh, you have to follow this um, uh, this equation. So it's the peak width. So the required cycle time is the peak width divided by the number of points uh, measurements you want on your peak. So the peak width is calculated at the basis of the peak. And it's depending of your chromatography. So it's depending of your column, it's depending of the rank lengths of the particles which, which are in a column. So you can have large or uh, narrow peaks. So you measure this, uh, so what we do usually, we make one injection, usually in DDA, and we look how uh, peaks uh, look like to uh, define what are the, the peaks, uh, the peak width for our chromatography uh, setup. So we measure that on several peaks and make an average. So I have an example here. If your uh, peak has uh, an on average 20 seconds, um, of widths, uh, and you want to have nine points to really well define uh, your peaks, you need to have a cycle time uh, lower than 2.2 seconds. So now how will you calculate the real cycle time that you have? So uh, it's a number, the number of scans, so the number of the IA window times the length in milliseconds of each 
uh, each scan. So you can hear, see here uh, an example of a DIA scheme. So we make one MS1, which uh, takes uh, 118 milliseconds. And then we have 30 windows covering the whole mass range from 4,000 to um, or 400 to 1,000. So these windows are 20, uh, 20 times uh, wide. And uh, each scan uh, takes um, 55 milliseconds, uh, 54 milliseconds. So in total, if I calculate uh, the real cycle time, I have a cycle time of 1.7 seconds. So it's lower than the 2.2 required to have nine uh, point across the peak. So I can say that here, yeah, my scheme is good enough to, uh, to have a good measurement of the peaks. So this uh, scan time uh, is depending on the analyzer you are uh, using. So for TOF instruments is um, basically always the same time. For Orbitraps, it depends on the resolution you use. So if you use a higher resolution, you have a better uh, accuracy on the measurement of the peaks, but it takes a longer time to get the, um, uh, the, the scan. So that's why the MS1, we usually uh, do that at uh, one, um, 120 uh, um, K of resolution. So it's a longer time than the, uh, the MS2 that we, um, that we do at 30 K of resolution. So now I come to your question. So how to choose the, the size and the number of the windows to cover the mass range. So uh, there is consideration that you need to, um, to know. So uh, if you use wide windows, uh, you get more complex spectra because you have more peptides entering the mass spectrometer. Uh, and because of this complex spectra, you get less identification. So here I have the example of before of a cycle time of 1.7 seconds, so which is good. And I have 30 windows of 20 times. So if I want to cover the same uh, mass range from 400 to 1000, I can, uh, but with, um, uh, with the spectra that are less complex, I can have narrow windows. So uh, the complexity is reduced in each, in each uh, in each uh, spectrum, but I need more of this scan to cover the whole mass range because now I have uh, 12 Thomson uh, windows instead of 20. So I have 50 windows, but each window takes the same time. Is the, the time is depending on the resolution, not of the size of the, of the window, the, the, the width of the window. So because I have 50 windows, I have a cycle time of 2.8 seconds. So it's higher than the 2.2 that I need to cover uh, my peak. Um, and um, the last thing to know is uh, you can uh, reduce a bit the mass range uh, you want to cover. So usually in our lab, we don't cover more than 880 uh, m over z. Uh, so if I um, remove the last um, the last windows, uh, I can keep this, uh, these narrow windows, but because I have less, I can uh, get a good cycle time. And we can reduce that because if you look at the distribution of the peptides on the on an analysis, so it's a, um, a scheme that shows you that uh, the, the distribution of the peptides, so is the retention time and is the mass of the peptides. So you see that there is really a few of the peptides that are above a thread. It's really um, a small part of the whole um, peptide. So, uh, we have calculated here that 90% uh, of the precursor peptides have a mass between 350 uh, and 870. Uh, uh, so meaning that we can cover an, until uh, 800 something and have almost, of, almost everything. So finally, as a summary, um, choosing the acquisition, the acquisition scheme is a compromise. In compromise between the window size, so the spectrum complexity, uh, the mass range, so the, the mass range you want to cover, the proportion of peptides you cover, the cycle time, so the number of peptides you want to have on your peak, and for orbit traps, the resolution, because the accuracy of the signal measurement is depending on the resolution you choose. So it's important to know when you are choosing that, that all these choices may have an impact of the quality of the results. So um, because of that, uh, GDA experiment is a very easy method to set up on a mass spectrometer. DIA really needs that you optimize your methods before uh, to make your analysis. 
So in routine on the proteomics platform, we have a method that we know that we are, well, for which we are using always the same column, the same chromatography, so we can run many samples in the same condition. So we are not optimizing for each experiment, but each time, each time you change the column or the run length, on, or, yeah, you need to, uh, to optimize that. Okay. Is it clear uh, for your question about the windows? Okay. So do you have more questions? Criteria do you follow uh, to set up a rate of pollution to be in place with the scan by the hospital by the spectrum? You, you mean which uh, column, uh, which uh, liquid chromatography parameters, which um, flow rate, for instance? Or? Yeah, there is a flow rate. Yeah, so the, the flow rate is depending on the column you are using. So usually um, large or wider columns, they, uh, they use um, higher flow rates. So this makes you able to, um, to have faster runs. So it's good when you, when you want to make high throughput proteomics, but you lose in sensitivity. If you uh, want to increase the sensitivity, have a better uh, proteome coverage, then you need to use a... Um, uh, um, uh, column with a smaller diameter and then uh, reduce the flow rates. So, uh, to get a, a good uh, coverage with the DIA, so uh, is that the flow rate from the IC part? Is that critical? If I can imagine that if you have uh, a, a, a tight flow rate on the LCMS, so if you, you are imposing kind of pressure on the instrument. To scan as fast as possible in order to cover what is yeah th yeah that that's true that when you when you are using very short gradients you have peaks so I am I made an example with a twenty second peak but sometimes we have peaks of six or even three seconds so it means that if you want if you want to have enough enough point uh, um, uh, across your peaks what you need is to uh, enlarge your uh, your windows. And have less windows, so then increase the um, complexity of the spectra. So it's it's really a balance. Um, if you have DIA, uh, if you're gonna have more coverage than DDA, wouldn't it be worth the hassle to choose DIA to set it up than using DDA? So, so the the setup, you can do it with DDA or DIA runs. What you need is just to have um to to have the the, the to 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 measure the the weights of your of your peaks. You can even do full scan, so you don't do MSMS. You just do MS one. The things is to uh to have an idea on how wide are your peaks depending on your chromatography column. So uh, it doesn't. I mean, it's not important which uh, which type of acquisition you do at that time. It's just that you want to uh, to have a parameter that makes you able to really see your peak, and then you can uh, set up the, the method. Uh, for the experiments. Just about terminology, um, the DIA is the same as uh, the novel sequencing. Is, is it uh, similar things? Are they different? Um... No, it's, it's really different. So the novel sequencing is um, is using uh, the the peaks in your uh, spectrum to try to find different um, mass differences. Um, that um, sign the presence of one of one amino acid. So if you have difference uh, between two peaks, you know it's an alanine. Another difference, you know it's a glycine, and so on. So these measurements uh, makes you discovering what is the sequence of your um, of your peptide. Uh, is the difference with what we are doing with DDA or uh, DIA? It's uh, with database search. A database search, you compare your peak to uh, theoretical uh, peaks that are calculated from the database. So you can use uh, DDA and DIA for the database search, but for the noble sequencing, you need to have a DDA uh, acquisition because you need to have a very clean uh, spectrum to be able to measure uh, between two peaks yeah. and to have the sequence of your peptides. Thank you. So uh, over the time, other uh, acquisition scheme has been proposed to try to improve um, uh, the IA methods. So uh, one group proposed variable windows. So in these windows, you see that they are not all of the same size. So you have 
seen uh, before that, uh, for example, in the high mass range, there is not so many uh, peptides. So you can um, set up the windows to have always the same amount of precursor uh, um, uh, entering the mass spectrometer for fragmentation. So this uh, makes crew having uh, the same uh, complexity for all the spectra. Another type uh, of uh, acquisition scheme is what is called stager or overlapped windows. So uh, in that case, so you see that if you have um, narrow windows, you are not able to cover the whole mass range. So, so yeah, it's 20, uh, 20 and uh, 10 Thompson windows. So you can get 10, 20 Thompson windows to cover the whole mass range, but you have uh, large windows. So what they have uh, proposed is from um, cycle to cycle, to just shift um, the windows. So you can keep this large window to cover all the mass range, but because of this shift, the, this shift uh, there is not so, um, as many peptides entering at the, um, the time. You have, there's not uh, um, as many peptides uh, co-fragmented in, uh, in your spectrum. So you see here with wide windows, I can uh, reconstruct this peak. If I uh, if ne with narrow windows, with wide windows, I have an interference of another peak, but this interference is strongly reduced if I use uh, overlapped windows. And the third um, type of uh, acquisition scheme is multiplex DIA and M S six DIA. So in that case, instead to use uh, sequential uh, wide windows, uh, they use uh, small um, windows of uh, four Thompson at different uh, type of the mass range uh, to uh, to finally cover all the mass range with very small uh, windows and multiplex uh, everything together. So all these three schemes, um, so they are, um, but we, we don't use them. So some, some labs does, but, uh, do, but um, uh, what is important for you to know is to know uh, how the acquisition has been performed because not all uh, the software tools uh, are able to handle with MSX or with uh, uh, overlap windows. So you, you have to know uh, how the acquisition has been performed. You have to know if your software uh, tool is able to, um, to, to, to use them. Uh, sometimes uh, you need to select a parameter to say, okay, I have overlap windows or so on. Okay, so now I go to the processing workflow. So is it a question before I move to that? I guess in the smallest post, the smallest the most compromised window size and other parameters, we can still get um, a couple of questions in the same MSC, right? Sorry. Um, um, even with the, the best parameters for, for the window size, mm -hmm. uh, we may still get, like, for example, two precursors that go to the MS2 and we will have overlapping. Yeah, there is always yeah. several precursors anyway. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's, so it's a compromise to have uh, the uh, not too complex spectrum, uh, not too uh, too long cycle, and things like that. But uh, anyway, it's it's still DIA, so you have uh, multiple uh, fragments of from uh, multiple um, peptides in uh, each uh, uh, MS2 spectrum. Okay, so that's why we use specific uh, processing workflows. So there is two uh, main type of uh, processing workflows. So the library free, free and the library based. So in the, with the library free, um, the tool used uh, the complex spectra and I use uh, mainly the retention times to try to reassemble uh, uh, precursor and fragments. So they make precursor fragment and, uh, assembly to reconstruct a pseudo MS2, uh, simple MS2 spectra that will contain only the fragment of one peptide. And then because of that, you can make a normal database search with uh, DDA tools, and then you get your peptide list. Uh, the second um, option is to use what we call the spectra library. So a spectral library is a library that, uh, that can be experimental. So you could have make um, DDA experiment with the same type of samples and collect many, um, uh, many uh, spectra uh, from these experiments. So they are simple spectra because they have been acquired in DDA. 
So what people do most of the time is they fractionate uh, representative samples to have a very deep coverage of the sample, and then you construct your experimental um, library. And this library is used to um, to extract the signal with with the complex spectrum. So each uh, each theoretical uh, each uh, each, spec uh, each DDS spectrum is used to extract the specific fragment of one peptide in the complex uh, uh, spectrum, and that you get a peak reconstruction and your peptide list. You can also use a predicted library. So the library is predicted from uh, your FASTA file, so from your sequence. So people have trained um, a deep learning model to learn uh, from a sequence how a mass, uh, MS2 spectra should be. And uh, so and with the, the different intensity of each uh, fragment. And uh, we use this predicted uh, spectra to extract the signal, the signal from the um, from the complex spectra and get the same uh, information. So here, here is a, an overview of the of the tools. So there is more than, than that. So it's the main tools that you have maybe heard about there. So for library free is mainly a uh, GIA and prior. And uh, in SpectroNode, there is, uh, which is a commercial uh, software, there is an option which is called direct DIA that works the same way. For library base, there is more uh, tools. So the first one to, that has been developed is OpenSWAT, which is uh, for which we have no new uh, version, which which is called DIA Proteomics. Um, what we use on the platform is Diane. Is this what you are going to see uh, today? But there is uh, many other ones. I will explain a few of them uh, at the end of this presentation. And uh, yeah, and just to add that uh, by the time it has been found that this library-based approach is usually more efficient than the library-free approach. Okay, so uh, to generate a DDA uh, spectral library, so as I said, what people do most of the time is uh, taking a representative samples or a pool of, your, uh, of the different samples you want to, uh, to analyze. And from this pool, you can make a fractionation. So we usually use IPH fractionation. So, so we fractionate at, after the digestion at peptide level. And uh, from these 12 or 20 fractions, we acquire uh, DDA analysis for each of them. And we make a database search with classical tool, uh, mascot or maxquant. And then you get a list of uh, identification, so peptides and proteins. And then you get you construct your library by using this information of identification plus the experimental uh, information, so the fragment intensity and the retention times. So the advantage of this library is it's based on experimental data. Uh, the inconvenient is that you have to add many uh, additional injection uh, to your experiment to get the library. So finally, it's. Uh, it's a um, workflow which is interesting if you have a large um, uh, sample set because you may add a few more um, fractions to your experiment. But if you have only 10, ex uh, 10, uh, 10 samples to run, you don't want to add, to add 12 fractions to, to your uh, experiment usually. So another option is to use predicted libraries. So as I said, they have been they are produced from the FASTA files uh, using uh, deep learning models that has been, that has been trained uh, for that. So get you, you get your predicted um, uh, spectral data uh, and uh, and then get your uh, spectral uh, predicted spectral library. So there is three um, uh, main tools doing that. So um, uh, um, Inferis is a, an option. Uh, within uh, uh, Proteome Discoverer, which is the software from Thermo, so it's a commercial software. Uh, there is also Proceed to, um, that can uh, produce this library. And Diane has his own um, uh, training model uh, embedded in the software. So with Diane, we have everything in one, uh, in one software. So the advantage of uh, this um, type of library is that it contains all possible sequence from your FASTA files your FASTA file, but uh, it creates a very large library because you have all these possibilities. And uh, this can create a computational challenge that the, uh, the, the software is going to take time to process all your, 
your files with this uh, huge library. And uh, it can be inefficient. If, for example, you are analyzing Plasma, you are creating um, uh, a library from a, a human FASTA, so it's protein from all the human body. Uh, but in your, in your uh, samples, you have just a fraction of this, uh, of this uh, protein, so you, um, you put pressure on your software uh, for uh, information which is unnecessary. Um, another um, inconvenient is that deep, deep learning model has not trained for all uh, PTNs. So um, to, to, to have appropriate uh, predictive spectra, you need to train the model. And if you, have, you, have, um, you are working on specific uh, PTMs, it might be that the model has not been trained for that. So you won't get uh, accurate um, uh, measurement uh, uh, prediction with that. Is it the predict intensity or the intensity? No, the predict intensity is the is really the finally the, the difference between um a with, a, with a classical database search, you use your FASTA files and you can calculate the mass of each fragment, right? Because you know that the from your sequence, you know that the trypsin is uh, cle is cleaves after each lysine and arginine, and you can so you can calculate the mass of your peptides, and you can calculate the mass of the possible fragments, but you don't know the intensity of your fragments. So the difference with this model is that they are really trained to know that uh, this fragment uh, is going to be to give an high peak, and this one is going to give a small peak. So you have really the, the fragment intensity in these libraries. Is it clear at that um, time? Okay, so now I want to speak about a third type of library that we call a GPF library or gas uh, phase fractionation library. So this one has been proposed by um, this group so that in this paper, so uh, Cheryl and colleagues. Uh, so this with this strategy, uh, what you do is you don't use a DDA library, but a DIA library. Actually, what you do is you are um, uh, creating a pool from your samples, and uh, you can um, you can inject this sample several times on the mass spectrometer to cover the whole mass range. But each injection is covering uh, a small part of the mass range. So the idea behind that is because you, you are covering just a small part of the mass range, you can use very narrow window and produce very uh, very low complexity uh, spectra. So then you create a library of low complexity spectra, but from DIA acquisition. Uh, so this, uh, so usually you had six strands, and these six strands they are first searched using a predicted library, but then you create your GPF library, which is really an experimental one because it's based on the on experiments. And this uh, new experimental library can be uh, used to search the normal uh, DIRNs for all your samples. So you can see here the corresponding schemes. So for the GPF library, you see that each injection covers a part of the mass range with very, very small windows. So it's usually two times on windows. So it's almost the size of the, the selection of one peptide. And, uh, and then your samples, and then they are running with a classical uh, DIS scheme. So uh, just to clarify, so when you, you say picture library, it's still using deep learning. Right? Yeah, so because you need to uh, analyze these six injections, you need a predicted library. But this, uh, this uh, workflow is interesting because uh, imagine you have uh, many samples, you have a, a set of uh, 200 samples. If you search again this big predicted library, it's going to take a lot of time because of the size of the library. Here you just have six um, a sample to search with this big library. And then you create the experimental library, which contain only the proteins that are really in your samples, so which is really smaller. And then the search will be really faster. So every time it's going to be a sample experiment specific library? Yeah, it needs to really, really a sample specific. So usually we uh, we make a pool or it can be a representative samples uh, that are the same type of the samples you want to analyze. I have, I have an example for that. Uh, we have run um, data sets. Uh, it was uh, 900, I think, um, DIA analysis of uh, cerebrospinal fluids, CSF. 
and uh, running them with the predicted library uh, took something like half an hour per, um, uh, per file. So uh, multiplying by 900 <laughs> samples is like a very long time. But when we use the GPF libraries, it was just like one or two minutes uh, per, uh, per analysis for each of the 900s. So uh, to create this gas phase fractionation, uh, as a summary, first acquire your um, uh, GPF data, so six injection with two times some windows, then acquire all your samples with the conventional window scheme, so 10 or 12, 12 times on window. Process GPI file using your predicted library, generate your GPF library, and then process your uh, sample file using the GPF library. So the, the author of this work, they suggested to uh, uh, analyze the GPF uh, samples in the same time that the experimental samples. So of course they are not run with the same um, uh, methods, the same parameters on the mass spectrometer. But you you do that in the same times, then you can use the the chromatographic info, the chromatographic information, which is uh, really uh, similar to what you have in your experimental sample. So um, I think probably I repeat what I have already said, but Advantage Library contains more identification because of these small windows. Uh, library contains fragments and density and retention time information, and it's smaller than the predicted library. So the inconvenience, so you have to add six additional injection, but it's less what, than what you would have with a DDA library. And depending on the case, we have found that predicted library might be more efficient than GPF library. So it will depend on the type of sample. Okay, so as summary, the day library is experimental uh, of a more moderate size and uh, requires many more injections. Predicted library is predicted, it's a large library, but you don't need to add more injection. GP GPF library is experimental of moderate size and uh, you add additional injection, but just a few. It also exists public library that you can uh, find on internet. Uh, so they are experimental, but they are from all the labs. So the retention time might not be uh, the same that what you will get in your own lab. Uh, they are also moderate size and they don't, does not require an additional injection on your side. So an example of public library is the Panuman library, which contains more than 14,000 samples. Uh, proteins uh, that has been uh, the version two has been published uh, last year. Yes. In the very rare samples, which would be best? Because I assume predictions there wouldn't be more, but, but you don't want to run them into the library. So the prediction is based on the sequence. So it doesn't doesn't matter if it's a rare species or not. Um, so yeah, so. The, yeah, the, uh, probably yeah, we, we, there is no no difference working with raw samples. Uh, yeah, except that if you are doing DGA library, you have to search with um with database, so the the FASTA file might be uh, not um uh, complete. Yeah. Um... My my question kind of brings us a little bit back uh, to the deep learning step. So, what kind of data are used to train the model uh, to identify the, I mean, to predict, for instance, the intensity of the fragments? So. I'm not a specialist, but what I know is they have trained uh, the, the model with DDA uh, experiments for which you have uh, the identification and the corresponding MS2 spectra. So because they are used many, many of them, uh, it makes a robust model for prediction. Okay. Um, so they're trained in DDAs means that they have bias for less abundant uh, courses, right? In yeah, that that's true. But um, you can always make fractionation to go deeper in your uh, in your proteome. And um, probably if you are, if you train a model with a multiple experiment that has been done all over the world, uh, because you, there is data repository for proteomics, so you can get. Uh, uh, 
many of these uh, of these DDA files. So probably depending on the conditions and things that there, you get more proteins. But that's true that there is protein of low abundance that are always difficult to find. But uh, in the end, the model now is um, no. Uh, from one second, what to get. So it's not depending of uh, if the peptide is known or not, it's just the sequence uh, function of what, what amino acid are in the sequence we get the, the spectrum. So, I mean, that now that the model is trained with many, many data, uh, it doesn't matter um, if the peptide has been already seen or not. The the, the model um, learn how from a sequence, how the, the, the fragment should be. From the sequence. So now we go. Oops, sorry. So I was just wondering if, like, papers would um, mention what kind of library they would use to search, or they just stop at like we use DDA versus DIA addresses. Sorry, excuse me. I don't get to when you publish a paper, would you specify like oh, we use D library or? Yeah, when you publish, you have to to uh, to to describe everything that you have done. So yeah, it's important to describe the exact workflow you have used. Yeah. Uh, so now for the processing tools. So as you see, there is many processing tools. So I'm not going through all of them. I just want to show you a few of them to uh, that are the mostly used in the community. Uh, but you can have a look to this um, to this review. It's a very uh, comprehensive review that has been published few years ago that summarized all uh, the tools that I can be used for the IA, either to predict, uh, to either to generate the spectral library or predict the spectral library, or to make the DIA uh, processing. And also depending, uh, you can also see which type of instrument uh, you can use with these files, with these tools. So the first tool is uh, Spectronauts. So Spectronauts uh, is a, a proprietary software. So it's uh, quite expensive, I have to say. Uh, it can work with uh, both library free, uh, as I said earlier, it's in, for, in Spectronauts it's called Direct DIA, or a DDA library. It has a very nice um, graphical interface uh, with um, peak visualization. So you can uh, see all the, the, the peptides on the side and the um, uh, reconstruction of your uh, the superposition of your fragments uh, in the windows. You can even uh, make manual correction. Um, uh, uh, you can re reject peaks that are not good, so you can um, have a complete overview of uh, of your experiment. <laughs> um, you can you have also um, a function to make uh, ratio calculations, statistics. Uh, you can produce. Uh, a graph, uh, it maps, uh, PCA, all kind of plot. So um, people really uh, like this uh, this software. There is many groups using it. So it was free for academic labs a few years ago. So ma many people were used to do it, but now it becomes a, 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 a you have to pay for it <laughs> now. Um, so yeah, so we don't we don't we don't use it, but it's, it's a nice tool. Um, uh, Encyclop. Uh, Cyclop DIA has been especially um, uh, developed for uh, the use of GPF library. It's an open source um, software, but it works in command line without visualization. So I have to say that the visualization is good to have. It's nice to see your peaks, but you have also to think that in one experiment you have um, tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of peaks. So anyway, you won't go to each peak to say, okay, it's good. I want to manually correct and anyway. So sometimes it's really not a matter if you cannot see uh, the peaks themselves. Um, <clears throat> but if you are interested in specific protein, it's good to uh, to just check by on, on this one. If you have seen, for instance, that you have a, a potential uh, biomarker candidate, you, you, you like to, uh, to go to your signal and see how it looks like. So anyway, um, the function of Anticlop DIA uh, are also included in Scaffold DIA, which has uh, which has a graphical interface, but it's a proprietary uh, software. Another tool which is sometimes used for uh, DIA is Skyline. So Skyline is open source. It does, as you can see, a very nice uh, graphical interface and visualization of the peaks. Uh, it can earn the library free uh, through the use of DIA Empire, which is embedded in the in the software, or it can use DDA library. 
But um, Skyline had been in initially developed for targeted proteomics, so SRM. Um, how the function, the menus are done is sometimes yeah. tricky to understand, sometimes difficult to find the parameters, how to set it up. So it takes some time, time to, uh, to get used to it. And uh, the other one, the last one is Diane. So Diane is a free uh, software, but it's not open source anymore. The codes has been removed from uh, GitHub. Uh, it can uh, use predicted uh, library or GPF library. It can even use DDA libraries through a search uh, by uh, the MS Fragger um, search engine. Uh, it can work on Windows or even on uh, Linux clusters. It has a gra graphical interface, but no visualization of the pics. So more to come um, in the next minutes. So now I wanted to talk a bit about the difference, about the benchmark of these different tools. So um, by the time people have tried to uh, to know what are the best tools for a different type of data set, so including our group. So we have published uh, in 2021 this, uh, this work where we have um, used um, an E. coli uh, sample in which we have uh, added small uh, quantities of uh, st proteomic standard, which is standard, which is called uh, UPS1. So UPS1 is a mixture of um, 48 protein, human proteins. So we knew what we uh, expected uh, in this uh, in these samples. We have acquired all these samples with uh, four different acquisition schemes. So narrow windows, wide windows, overlap, uh, mix its uh, variable windows I've shown before. And we have tried, uh, we have used either a DDS spectral library or a FASTA file, so a FASTA file to um, uh, to use in a, li in a library free mode or to use as a predicted library. And we have um, select six software, two proprietary and, two, and four free or open source software uh, to test. So I'm not going to go in all the details of the results, but I just want to show you the conclusion that we have uh, learned from this work. Uh, so the first conclusion is that narrow windows are better than wide. <clears throat> it's, um, so it's what I said since the beginning of this uh, <clears throat> of this uh, talk, and it's um, it's not it's, it's non it's not very known now. But um, uh, at the time we published this paper, is that there was a uh, few uh, number of work that demonstrate the difference between narrow and wide windows. Uh, so in with the narrow windows, we get. Uh, 18% more peptides in the FASTA mode and 5% more peptides in the library mode. And we see no significant improvement using overlap or make windows, but it was on our sample set. It could happen that with our sample set, we get a different result. The second conclusion is that DGBA library is not needed. This was a, a, an important question because as I said, DGBA library requires many more uh, uh, additional injections. So uh, we found that uh, in, in a library free mode or in a library with a predicted library, we have similar performance at the protein level. And we even get 60% more peptides uh, quantified, meaning that we have the same number of, uh, of proteins, but we, uh, we have a better coverage of each protein. And the third conclusion was that the different tools rep report different results. So with our um, uh, sample sets, uh, we found the best uh, performance with Diane, Scaffold DIA, and Spectronaut. Uh, Scaffold DIA uh, and Spectronaut, um, but Scaffold DIA and Spectronaut, you see that we have uh, less missing value in the small, um, in a, in, when we add uh, um, small uh, amount of uh, UPS1 proteins, we have less, uh, We've, we found peptides, but uh, uh, by looking at the data, we had the idea that it report noise and not real uh, signal measurements. So it might be also uh, errors. So another um, uh, article has been published uh, more recently uh, um, to, to compare all these uh, tools. So in that case, they use six uh, data sets acquired on different type of instruments. Uh, they have processed with uh, five uh, different tools, and they use spectral library or sequence library as FASTA. 
So it's, this is all what they have tested, and um, they found that the library of free approach outperformed library res, library res, library based methods. So as we found also, but they said when the spectral library has limited comprehensiveness. So if you have a very comprehensive library uh, acquired in a, in a, in DDA mode, it offers it offers benefits for most TIA analysis. They also show that Diane has the best performance in terms of identification, computational efficiency, and compatibility when analyzing different uh, formats of DIA-MS data. Uh, but they also uh, found the SpectroNote uh, encompass a variety of downstream analyzing pipeline that can help inexperienced users. So yeah, as I said, SpectroNote is a very friendly, um, uh, user-friendly uh, tool. So people that are starting with DIA like to use it. Okay, so do you have questions before I go to the last part of my talk? No? Okay. So uh, I just want to have a, to, sh to give a bit of information on uh, what I called Ivan ZIA on a cutting edge instrument. So recently there is new instrument that uh, make the ZIA analysis much more performant than it was before. So the first one is called the IAPASF on Team Stuff instrument. So it's instrument from Broker. So this instruments uh, series include um, ion mobility drift tube. So it's what you see here at the beginning of the of the of the scheme of the this the internal part of the of the mass spectrometer. And um, in this drift tube, the peptides ion are separ uh, separated according to the collision cross section, so what we call CCS. And this uh, CCS depends on the ion structure and charge, so it doesn't depend on the mass. So finally, it adds a fourth dimension in the analysis. So in addition to have the M over Z, the retention time and the intensity, you also get the information on the CCS. So PASF stands for parallel accumulation serial fragmentation because you have a, this uh, separation in the within the instruments before to have the, um, the measurement of the ions and the fragmentations. So here you can see in the IA PASF that the uh, isolation the isolation of the isolation of the quadruple uh, <clears throat> for fragmentation is uh, depending also of the so it's also function of the ion mobility. So in a single uh, team scan, ions from selected mass range are fr fragmented to record ion mobility, ion mobility result, MSMS spectra of all precursors. So what it means is, again, you have this information of ion mobility uh, within your spectra. And what is important to know is this um, uh, ion mobility can exclude um, signal th that is not important. For example, here on the top, you can see that you have um, two lines of um, of uh, ions. So the one which is at the top cor correspond to um, single charge ions. So usually single charge ions are not peptides. And when they are peptides, they are not uh, appropriate for fragmentation. You don't get a good fragmentation with uh, mono single charge uh, ions. So finally, with the ion mobility, you can select only the, the, uh, the ions you want to uh, fragmentate and it increase, uh, fine, reduce the complexity of the spectra and increase the, the identification you can get from complex spectra. So with this method, they were able to uh, identify more than, more than 5,000 proteins in 20 minutes. So this was with the first generation of TIMTOS. Now with the new generation, it has even increased uh, much more. Uh, and um, in this, um, interesting work that has uh, been, pu been published quite recently, I think. Uh, yeah, I don't want it down, but uh, it's quite recent. Uh, they have uh, shown that um, by using uh, um, two um, uh, processing tools, so frag pipe, uh, which contain MX Fryer, which is a search engine, and, uh, and Diane, uh, they can uh, really increase uh, the, the, the result they get from a DIA passive analysis. So you see with the standard pipeline, you, the result they get in gray and in, uh, in green, you have the, with the frag pipe and Diane methods. So what they, they could show is that they are able to identify 800 proteins from ELA cells. 
But even if you inject only 10 nanogram, which is very a small amount because typical uh, injection is to uh, 100 or 500 nanograms, you can even get uh, quite a lot of protein. So yeah, uh, five, uh, 500,000. Uh, they also show that very short trends uh, also give interesting uh, number of proteins. So uh, the number on the bottom, 200, um, uh, 100, 200, and 600 SPD stands for samples per day. So 60 is run of, of about uh, 20 minutes. Um, 100 is 10 minutes run, and 200 is five minutes run. So even with very short run, you can get uh, 5,000 proteins. They could also show that their, uh, their method outperform what you can get uh, with spectronauts with the same uh, data sets. And the last thing is, is, uh, is the NDIA on orbital pastoral. So the orbital pastoral is the mass spectrometer you have seen uh, on the facility uh, yesterday. So as I said yesterday, it has an um, additional uh, analyzer, which is extremely fast in the scanning speed. So it can scan at 20 hertz per second. So it means 20, um, sorry, not 20, 200 hertz, so 200 scans per second, which is very fast. And it also has a dynamic range detector. So because of this very fast scanning speed, uh, what you can do is you can have very uh, narrow windows of Tutor, the same, the Thompson, the same that you have in uh, in the GPF library, but you can cover the whole mass range with these very small windows. So finally, the the scheme I showed you before with the compromise with the astral, we don't have to make this compromise anymore because of this uh, two Thompson windows. Uh, we have a low uh, complex. Um, uh, spectra, so window size can be reduced uh, while covering the whole mass range and keeping appropriate cycle time with a good resolution. So that's why this instrument is so performant. So it has been really a game changer in the in the proteomic field. You see that uh, the the difference we have for, uh, from two of our of our instruments. So this is a result we have uh, produced from. Um, from our lab that uh, it reproduced that has been uh, shown in the literature. So the Exploris is, uh, the, you remember that there was two uh, similar mass spectrometer in our facility. So it's the, the Exploris and the Astral is the new one. So you see that we get many more uh, identifications. So more than 1100 um, uh, proteins with ELI cells and uh, with PBMC uh, with 45 minutes runs. Uh, we could also show that we can really decrease the, the, um, the amount of uh, peptide we inject. So when we inject 250 uh, picogram of material, it corresponds to the amount of protein in a single cell. So in a single cell, we have five, uh, in the amount of protein for a single cell, we have 5,000 uh, proteins. <clears throat> you can even uh, uh, decrease this time and still have some identifications. Uh, what is interesting also with this mass spectrometer, so because it's very fast, we, you can, we can also uh, make uh, very short trends. So we have more than uh, 8,000 proteins with only five minutes gradients. Um, so in this work, they have shown that uh, Diane and Spectronaut are both efficient to process, to process the astral uh, NDA data. Uh, one important thing to uh, retain about the astral, so it's the real inconvenient, is generate very, very big uh, um, raw files. So we get files uh, between 10, 20 gigs, sometimes even more, 40, 50. So the astral had the capacity to uh, generate uh, one tera of data per day, which is really huge. So it chooses to store, it chooses to process, and so it it really gives a computational challenge. And uh, because of that, uh, yeah, so the data processing becomes the bottleneck of, uh, of proteomics. So there is uh, still um, uh, improvement to do for that. So as a summary of my presentation, so the benefits of DIA is that uh, DIA uh, show more uh, peptide and protein identification than the DDA in most of the case. Uh, DIA passive and, and DIA enable unpre unprecedented protein coverage. And library-free approaches are effective to process DIA datasets.
the challenge is uh, DIA requires fine tuning of acquisition parameters. Uh, and DIA on rec recent instruments generate large uh, file size. So for large data sets, data processing has become the bottleneck. So we need to develop or improve DIA processing tool for this uh, new um, acquisition methods. So that's it for that. So do you have more questions? <laughs>